Good evening. It's Wednesday night. I'm, I'm excited about these Wednesday night studies that we're doing. And what we're doing is we come on Sunday morning. I preach the topic. Then I come back Sunday night, explain it again. And then we come back on Wednesday night and kind of dig a little deeper. And that's what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to dig a little deeper into the text that we looked at Sunday morning, Sunday night. We're living in a very interesting hour. And so I want us to go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord just to be with us first as we look at the text. If you have a Bible, go ahead and look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20 again. All right, we're going back to this for the third time. Uh, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, our concept of who you are, Jesus, is so important. Help us as we look at this to understand that you were asking the disciples, who do men say that I am and who do you say that I am? It's a very deep, profound question that we must ask ourselves in this hour. So be with us tonight as we look at this. In thy name we pray, amen. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Let me read it to you again and, and just kind of walk through a little bit of what we talk about Sunday, and then we'll kind of go from there, and uh, hopefully it'll, be, it'll bless you. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, Others say you're Jeremiah and one of, are one of the prophets. Then Jesus looked at them in verse 15 and said unto them, but whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed are thou Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say unto you also that thou art Peter, and upon this testimony, a testimony of who you say I am, I'll build my church. And upon this testimony, I say unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, this testimony, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus, the Christ. And let me give you a little background here. They're in a Gentile territory, Caesarea Philippi. They're about 120 miles from Jerusalem, okay? It is in the center of Baal worship. Matter of fact, the Greek god Pan is there and the shrine is there. Herod the Great has built a temple there for Caesar Augustus. And actually people were bowing and calling Caesar God at that time. And in the midst of this pagan territory, not in Jerusalem, not in Rome, not in Greek, not somewhere where Jesus could have made a great proclamation, he turns to the 12 and he asks them this simple question. Whom do men say that I am? They said to him, some say you're one of the prophets. Some even say that you're John the Baptist that has come back reincarnated after even his head being taken. So we know that the political arena and the religious arena were saying this. Everybody was talking about who this Jesus was, but they were not saying he was the son of God. For the Jews to say that, would almost would, would be blaspheming, okay? And we'll, we'll get into that in the next couple of Wednesday nights. But he said, okay, so who are they saying I am? Then he turns to the 12 and he says, who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus? Okay, that's the question tonight that we're gonna ask at seven o'clock. And we're going to have some papers that we're going to pass out and some questions that we're going to do to tonight. Maybe take a little time 
Look at what the world is saying Jesus is. Who is Jesus? We're very quick to give a religious answer because we're in a religious setting. Oh, he's my savior. He's my soon returning king. He's my healer. Uh, but then you find it interesting as you get in the world and you get around other people, a lot of people are wanting, if I may, to upgrade Jesus. They want to make him a little more popular than what he was, or they want to change who he is. They want to make him, and for sake of us looking at it tonight, they want him to have a little pop about him. Maybe, maybe have him looking different, walking different, talking different. Uh, and we find this in the media world today, and we find this in Hollywood, and we find this in other places where at one time they were very comfortable letting Jesus be who he was. We're now coming up on a few weeks on the time of the resurrection of our Savior, Easter. And we're gonna celebrate who Christ is. He is our Redeemer and our soon returning King, and he's our Savior. But if you'll watch, they've changed who he is. Matter of fact, Jesus now is a Jesus that preaches and teaches, according to humanity, equality. So if I may tonight, let's look at Jesus for just a few moments in a pair of straight-legged pants with a pair of sandals on, smiling at everybody and everybody having fun and treating everybody equal, loving everybody unconditionally. And no matter what background they are, no matter what's going on in their life, that's who he loves. He loves them just like that. And it doesn't matter their gender reference, doesn't matter their sexuality, doesn't matter if they're married or not, doesn't matter anything. That's just who Jesus is in the eyes of the world. Then there's another Jesus that has been created <clears throat> that's really interesting to me. This one is patriotic. This Jesus is ultra conservative. Um, when it comes to moral issues, he's very conservative. This Jesus that the world has created loves America above even Jerusalem. Matter of fact, this Jesus that the media and the world has created is happy when America flies the American flag rather than talking about the cross at Calvary. This Jesus that the world is looking for is a Patriotic Jesus, matter of fact, he's a Jesus that is very American. And we've talked about this the last couple of weeks about how we've Americanized everything in God's word. So this Jesus now is very Americanized. He's very Hollywood oriented. Uh, this Jesus is United States sort of, hey, Israel, get out of the way. We're the chosen people. We're the chosen make people, the nation and make America great again. God bless the USA. Is that really the Jesus of the Bible? Matter of fact, if you don't like the Jesus that is in straight legged pants, if you don't like the Jesus that is ultra conservative, if you don't like the Jesus that is political, if you don't like the Jesus that accepts everybody's agenda, why don't you just make Jesus into what you would have him to be? It's almost like walking down a buffet line and saying, I want this part of the truth of Jesus. I'll take this biblical truth, but I'm gonna leave this part of him. I'll pass over judgment, but I want all the grace that I can get. I'll pass over the sinful things and the things of the blood. Matter of fact, I don't want the bloody Jesus. I don't want the Jesus that has the cross I want the Jesus that is resurrected. I want the Jesus that loves everything and everybody. But that's not the Jesus of the Bible. And that's not the Jesus that we see. But see, we, we've set a menu in front of society the world has, and they've created this Jesus that is really not. They've manufactured something into, matter of fact, I'll go ahead and say it. They've created Jesus to be 
an idol. So what happens in the gospels, Jesus introduces himself to the disciples. One of the disciples is going to reject him. We know this is Judas. He's going to sell him out. But now Jesus is going to, he's going to give his life in the gospels. As a matter of fact, the Jews not only, not only don't accept him as the son of God, now those that are following him cannot accept the reality that he is going to lay down his life and lead people from that direction rather than being a militant Jesus they're looking for. Do you remember the argument they had? Who's gonna sit on your right side? Who's gonna sit on your left side? Jesus, when are you gonna go back and take over Jerusalem? When are you gonna defeat Rome? When will you defeat the soldiers? That was not Jesus. It was never who he intended to be. So the revealing of Jesus again comes on the scene in the word of God after the disciples live that life pleasing to him, after he gives his life and he's resurrected and he sends to the right hand of the father, the disciples preach and teach that Jesus Christ and him crucified. Then we get to a very interesting place. Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one, and I'm going to start at verse four, and I'm going to read a few verses, not reading all of them, but I want you to go back and read them. He is now writing a letter to the seven churches, which represents all those that are following Christ. Remember the statement that he made that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church? And upon the testimony of who Peter says he was and others was, that he would accomplish what he was going to accomplish. So now John is on the Isle of Patmos and Jesus is going to send a revelation of who he is back to the disciples through the church. But I want you to listen very carefully of what he says and how he explains himself to the church, Revelation chapter one, and I'm picking it up at verse four. Revelation chapter one, picking it up at verse four. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is faithful witness the first begotten of the dead and of the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Drop down to verse seven. Now he's gonna give a revelation to the churches of who Jesus is. Behold, <clears throat> he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Matter of fact, the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. So here in Revelation chapter one, verse seven, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him that also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall well before him, even so, amen. Jesus says the following, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, I'm the Almighty. For sake of time, drop down to verse 10. Revelation chapter one, verse 10. John again says this, <clears throat> I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, Jesus again is saying this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. He says, clear up the understanding of who I really am. And then he talks about the seven churches to send it to. And then in Revelation chapter one, verse 12, 
This is what John records. <clears throat> and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like of the Son of Man. Who do people say that I am? He's like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girt about with a pouch with a golden girdle. His hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as the flame of fire. His feet were a fine brass as it burned in a furnace and his voice as a sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in the strength. And John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me saying, fear not, I am the first. And the last, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I live forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Man, that's a huge difference of what we see in the church world today and what we see in the world today of what they've created Jesus to be. It's a huge difference and it's a huge level of respect and reverence that John has. John falls to his feet, falls to his face, and he fell down his feet as dead. He literally fell straight down. And Jesus says to him, fear not. I am the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And amen. And have the keys of hell and death. He says, I have the answer to all eternal questions. I have the answer to all the questions of life. And he talks about who he is. And he talks about how his eyes were the flame of fire. And his feet like brass burned in the furnace. And his voice is a sounding of many waters. But I think what I find so interesting is that when John gets a revelation of who Jesus is, Jesus tells John, give this revelation back to the churches. Let them know who I am. Question come, who do men say that I am? And then he would turn to the disciples and say, who do you say that I am? And Peter would say that art the Christ, the son of the living God. But they still couldn't quite get what he was doing for them in the eternal part of it. They were dealing in the moment in the flesh. Matter of fact, you read a little further in that original text that we looked at, and we find that in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, 13 through 20, that right past that, Jesus is going to have to correct Peter. And he's gonna to have to remind them that in that background and in that setting, he says, I am going to go back to Jerusalem and I am going to give my life. They're not going to take it. And, but they wanted an earthly answer to their earthly problems. Jesus said, I'm an earthly moment revealing to you that the answers are answerable, but they're in an eternal place. He literally was saying to them that what you're seeing in front of you is nothing compared to what I have in store for you. The vision that John saw in Revelation of a resurrected, glorified Christ is terrific, it's traumatic, it's unbelievable, it's unforgettable, but more than anything else, it is true. So John was given this letter to write it to the churches, to go back to the churches and say, I want you to know who he really is. But due to our sinful nature, and matter of fact, if you'll read everything of the churches, he said this to them, I have somewhat against thee. And he would share some things that they were letting get into their heart and in their life in the physical realm that was affecting the reality of who God was, who Jesus was. During Jesus' earthly ministry, he had refused 
at some times to trust individuals in their hearts because their hearts were not in the right place. And this is a very hard thing for us to swallow once in a while to look at this, but we have to look at this. At John chapter two, verse 23 through 25, Jesus made this statement. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles, which he did, they believed in the, thin, the, the moment right then. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify man for he knew what was in that man's heart. They were more concerned about being fed, being healed, being delivered right then, right that moment. And they wanted a Jesus to set up their earthly kingdom and Jesus' kingdom, even throughout his whole ministry, was more about a spiritual kingdom. He understood that if he left humanity to all of our flaws and our natural things that we look at, our description and our concept of Jesus or who Jesus is would change. Now, let me give you a very simple point of this, and, and, and we're going to share it in more detail tonight at seven o'clock. That's why we have so many false religious denominations because the concept they wanted of Jesus was not what was in God's word and was not what originally was said by Peter, was not what was, said, was preached by the disciples after the resurrection of Christ. So they added to or took away from the fundamental foundation of Jesus Christ and him crucified and the nations around the world bounced off of that false religions. And it doesn't take much for you to look at many different religious sects that are around us. They will talk about God. They will talk about Abraham. They will even say that Jesus was possibly a prophet, possibly a good man, but they will not go as far as to say that he is the savior and the redeemer of the world. Matter of fact, they'll put him in the light of many others. But when it comes to Jesus being King of Kings and Lord of Lords, they will not bow to him. And matter, there will be a day, and we've talked about this later, earlier, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But we find throughout the gospels and throughout the writings of the disciples Many of these areas that we find where they were changing who Jesus really was and they were trying to reel them back in and bring them back around. And I wanna look at one of them here real quickly tonight. Look with me if you would at the book of Romans chapter one, verse 21. Our natural mind is darkened when it relates to spiritual truths. Unless we know Jesus Christ as our personal savior and we become Bereans of God's word and we dig for spiritual truths in God's word, we can get swayed very quickly. Romans chapter one, verse 21 and 22. Look at this with me. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their what? In their own imagination or their own thought processes. And their foolish heart was darkened. Romans 1.22 really punches hard. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. If we want Jesus to be a politician, he becomes a politician. If we want Jesus to be a Jesus that does not offend anybody, he becomes a Jesus that does not offend anybody. If we want Jesus to be something that fits into our category and our lifestyle, we take away 2 Timothy 3.13 even says it like this. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The natural tendency of an unregenerated mankind is to proceed from bad to worse, 
deceiving and being deceived. I want you to hear that again. The natural tendency for an unregenerated mankind is to proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I could stop here and share with you a lot of many different things that I have seen Christ betrayed at that he's not. But I would not want to give the enemy glory for that. But I want you to understand, even in the church world, we have created him to be a lot of what he's not. If we need prosperity, He's a prosperity gospel. He's a prosperity God. He's a Jesus that comes with money flowing out of his pocket. If he's a Jesus that does not divinely heal us, we blame him rather than looking at us. If we are living in a compromising situation, we'll find a compromising place to find where he fits into our life rather than molded into his likeness and his image. We're taking him down off the cross. We're taking ourself down off the cross. We're not denying self. We're not crucifying the flesh. Matter of fact, if anything, we're glorifying the flesh in his name. We're edifying man, our man's abilities in his name. There's no denying, there's no dying, there's no uh, self, it's all self-righteousness. Matter of fact, Titus chapter three, verse three would say it like this. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. At one time, we were living for ourselves. So we create a Jesus that meets our need. I want to close with this tonight. Go with me to where Paul is writing. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And he says, You who hath quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, when in times past, you walked according to the course of this world. Now stop right there. If we're not careful, we'll walk according to the world today when we want Jesus to do things that he's not intended to do. And according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, if we're not careful, we'll wind up hearing the voices of the world or the voices of the media, or voices of the political system, and we're creating an atmosphere where Jesus fits into that, and we tell Jesus that this is who you are. You're a political Jesus, you're a, you're a Democrat Jesus, you're a Republican Jesus, you're a conservative Jesus, you're, you're a Jesus that does this, you're a Jesus that does that, and then we create an atmosphere that Jesus looks at you and I and says to us, you're neither hot nor cold. Because you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spew you out of my mouth. Then he looks at us and he says, why are you worshiping things of the enemy rather than standing for the things of the kingdom? And so Ephesians chapter two, verse five, four, it goes on to say, but God who is rich in his mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, hath quickened us together, how? With Christ. I pray tonight that the Christ that you know, who is Jesus? The Jesus that you know and the Jesus that I know is the one that will abundantly guide us and direct us in this hour that we're living in. Brothers and sisters, we cannot create a Jesus to meet the 21st century. We've got to follow a Jesus that is going to take us through the 21st century. 
We cannot create a Jesus that is going to be a Jesus that is not going to offend. Because if you follow Jesus, there are going to be offenses that come. Matter of fact, Jesus said to us that Father and Son would be in discord. Matter of fact, Son would turn against Father, Daughter would turn against Mother. And we talk about the Jesus that we follow is, is going to lead us through this hour that we live in. So it's our responsibility not to change the Jesus that we worship and serve. Because society is changing Jesus. So the question I started with and the question I end with tonight, and I want you to take a maybe a little time you're sitting there with somebody and just turn this off or maybe you can answer. I don't mind you answering it on this. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus according to the evening news? Who is Jesus according to your neighbor? Who is Jesus according to your family and friends? Who is Jesus according to what you think? And then who is Jesus according to God's word? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And upon this testimony, Peter, of who I am, I will build the church. Jesus Christ will be that cornerstone. But I've got to ask you tonight, is what you believe fitting on that cornerstone? I pray the Lord blesses you tonight. I pray that God will keep you and be with you. And as you watch and listen to the world that we're in today, Ask this simple question, what Jesus are they really talking about? May we pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the faithfulness of the congregation. Bless those that are not able to be with us tonight. Bless us tonight at seven o'clock as we worship together. May your spirit rest upon homes and lives. May your healing virtue touch. May you touch bodies. May you touch individuals for your glory. In thy name we pray, amen.